Hello everyone. Welcome back to yet another interesting conversation on future of work. I would like to welcome our moderator, Ms. Rituparna Chakravarti, co-founder EVP Team Lees. Welcome. Ma'am. Now welcoming our panelists, Mr. Vatish Survasiddhi, Senior Head, Digital Skills, Innovation, Industry Partnerships and CSR, NSDC. Torvi Devra, CEO and co-founder, CareerGuide.com. Harsha, CEO, India Affiliate of the Institute of Risk Management, UK. Rachit Mathur, Founder and CEO, Avenue Growth. Sanjeev Jha, Sanjeeva Jha, Co-Founder and CEO, Broad Arc Technologies Private Limited. Over to you, Mr. Chakrabar. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you um, for giving us the opportunity. And uh, it's kind of scary because uh, you, uh, the subject is future of work. And, you know, uh, in the month of February, I was uh, speaking in a conference. <laughs> I think it's an Indian Staffing Federation conference itself. And I had said future is unknowable. And I did not realize that it will scarily come true within a month or less than a month in the form of the crisis that we are going through. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, I have really made this quote a cliche by now, but my belief in this is getting stronger day by day. Crises like these don't create new trends; they amplify the existing ones. So, and I was going through this list. Uh, I can with ease uh, call these organizations the offsprings of 2008 global meltdown. So, if you let's pause for a moment and try to think uh, when WhatsApp was not part of our lives. Like, uh, Uber, the organization we call the progenitor or amplifier of the gig phenomena, is also a child of the 2008 meltdown. I'll just give you, run you through some very interesting aspects. WhatsApp, it was founded in the month of May 2009, Groupon, November 2008, Instagram, October 2010, Uber, March 2009, and Slack, 2009. Zeitgeist is a beautiful word which means uh, the mood of a particular time. And I think the world would go through the 2008 kind of a zeitgeist in terms of recovery at this point. It's coming specifically to the organization. We've seen how the share prices of five tech firms, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook, has on an average gone up by 30% from 25th of March, 2020. Though there are a lot of points talking about their cap capital structure and finance in this, but in general, the organization which prepared themselves for a quarter century have sailed. Organizations of future will be way more tech enabled with variable cost structures, a direct boost for the gig economy, asset light, and that would be in balance with the earnings. Employers are also being reminded of the need to be more flexible, agile, and fluid. Uh, they had gathered flab during the good time, but are now being compelled to be flexible enough to morph their organization structures from pyramids to cylinders and Eiffel Towers. So I'm not going to talk more. I think I just wanted to set the context about how we should be looking um, at the future and of course, we've got a bunch of really eminent uh, panelists here who probably would be able to throw more light. Uh, so I think, uh, am I audible? Sorry. Yes. So sorry. I think yes. There was absolute silence at the other end and I did not realize what was going on. <laughs> uh, so um, I think um, I am today amongst uh, a really august company of uh, uh, specialists and experts, I think, who would be much more um, equipped to give us, give you all a landscape in terms of. So uh, I, 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 I just am, I feel privileged to be in the role of trying to moderate today's conversation because between Harsh, Survi, Venkatesh, uh, Rachit, Rachit, I saw you somewhere. Uh, I think you're there, right? I saw you somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm here. So it makes the job so much easier. So, um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, let's get started. So I think what we would, uh, 
we, we are live right now, right? Hello? Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. So I, I think what essentially we would do is that we will try and bring, because I think the subject is so vast, uh, it's very uh, easy for us to get um, I, what I call in my mind uh, lost in the nitty gritty. So I think uh, first we would, uh, I would request each of the panelists to spend about a minute to kind of throw a very open perspective towards their view about the future of work. And then maybe we will, amongst ourselves, try and approach this whole uh, aspect of future of work, cutting across the four primary levers, which probably helps us organize our thoughts around this, for example, around the emerging business ecosystems. How do we handle human capital? What are the legal and regulatory policies which we sh think should emerge to deal with the future? And of course, how technology and innovation can transform our lives. So I think uh, with on that note, I think we could uh, start the deliberations. Uh, I would uh, uh, request then, uh, Sanjeeva, do you want to go first in terms of, uh, you know, your opening thoughts and remarks and maybe after we spend a minute amongst all of us and then delve deeper into each of the four levers. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ritu Padna. Uh, just a moment, I mean, before I get into the topic proper, so very rightly brought out, you know, that 2008 meltdown and, and the cataclysmic changes is what I would put it as, I mean, that we saw, but then we saw a period where, I mean, the uh, these organizations that you just named, you know, starting from Uber to the various uh, technology companies i mean how how they kind of uh, took that opportunity and they kind of bounced back so i mean uh, while that's the thought so i thought i mean this is a period where i mean we've been talking about it this pandemic has brought in these seismic changes and it has actually altered the way we look at our work and the way we look at the workplace so one of the biggest changes has been i mean uh, how how do we orient the workplace? So, I mean, all along we've been happy working in these office spaces. Now, suddenly you say that, okay, you start working from home. And uh, to, to to my surprise and, and probably, uh, probably all employers that well, what we are seeing now is, uh, I mean, people have been found to be more productive working from home. So that's a big, big, big takeaway. I mean, had, had, had you told me this about a, about six months back that people can stay home and work and they'll be as productive, probably I, I, I would I would have actually agreed with you. But I mean, the way I see uh, that's one big shift that we are seeing. Uh, the other one is how how quickly you you adapt to changes i mean you probably people tend to underestimate themselves so if you see uh post the pandemic the entire shift to online has been rather seamless i would say and in quick time so i mean i, I was just reading about uh the microsoft gentleman mr satya nadera so he says that two years of digital transformation has happened in two months so the technologies have actually adopted to themselves i mean the tools and technologies have uh, worked over time to make themselves relevant to the users and here you have you have zoom now 300 million uh, daily users can you beat that you have microsoft team which is grown by 70 percent can you beat that i mean so that's the kind of uh, uh, adoption of technology that has happened i mean and with that i think one big shift that has come out in the workplace is on the skills that the people require you know i mean that's we are going to see a lot of uh, adaptation required to manage those skills so uh, uh, you know adopting technology maybe reskilling maybe upskilling and that's one uh, big area of work probably where uh, I think, uh, you know, employers and employees have to work hand in hand. So that's one big thing that I see from a people perspective. And from an employer perspective, of course, as these work from home becomes, uh, you know, uh, something which is very, very uh, done thing you obviously need to have a plan in place which says you know how do you evaluate performance how do you evaluate efficiencies how do you have a social contract with your employees because that employee is sitting out there at home and he has a family to manage and he's working from home so it's a different kind of an environment so which are the soft factors that you need to take into account and uh, to top it all the cultural aspect you know the, it, it, it's actually throws up a big one which is you know uh, 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 what you call a hybrid model is what I would say. So few, most people working from home, few people working from office. So you, as an employer, you need to manage the two and it should not be one against the other. And yet the, you know, the cultural ethos of the organization needs to be maintained. So that's the softer aspect of it. 
I mean, uh, broadly speaking, this is what I had in my mind. I thought, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good. That's a good opening thing. I think you uh, mentioned a lot of points, which I think each one of those points need to be dealt with. Uh, I'll probably come to you, Suravi. Uh, probably if you could spend a minute telling us your way of looking at future of work. It's the most popular uh, hashtag going around these days. If you would unmute yourself, Suravi. Sure. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't see what we see currently as future of work because we are not working remotely currently or working from home. We are working amidst pandemic. It's work amidst pandemic. I won't even call it work from home or remote working because here we are talking about a lot of things, a lot of scary conversations, scary things happening around with family members, with neighbors, with country, with economy, right? And hence, the real idea of remote working or work from home has not really been visible. A lot of people, a lot of organizations see what they're seeing from last six months as future of work, but I I'll, I'll want everybody to think about maybe uh, this pandemic, what it has done, rightly mentioned, digitization has been fast paced and the mindset has been changed. Today, an organization is not thinking about or is apprehensive about should I hire somebody sitting in remote areas? Let's say sitting in court, do I hire that person or sitting in ABC village or town or country? So this truly this globalization has come in terms of when it comes to work, right? But coming to productivity, coming to the way uh, employees are taking it up or the way every organization got time to react to it was very different. Uh, the way they saw it or the way they reacted to it. So my suggestion to anybody who is against remote working or work from home or who's saying that, okay, productivity is down or my mental health is being uh, you know affected, I would request them to rethink because if future of work is work from home and remote working, it will be not amidst pandemic. So there'll be a lot of social support, social uh, gatherings, or uh, you can sit in Europe Valley and you could be working, right? So I would say Ritapurna and all the esteemed panel that yes, the mindset has changed. Today as organization, I'm pretty much okay to have my 100% employee on remote. I have been able to set processes, able to think through processes where my 100% people can go remote. But yes, I do understand that this is a lot of lapses right now what we are seeing. And in terms of mental health, in terms of team collaboration, in terms of brainstorming, this becomes very important. So I'll share what's biggest challenge at present in remote working or working from home. Currently, we are at Career Guide is facing. Everybody is not present at a given point of time. Somebody is present at morning 10 to 5. Somebody is present from 5 to 10, right? So this is one very big challenge. I think we should talk more about that. So Ritapurna, that's that's my take on Karen's future of work. Thank you. I, I would love to right now be sitting in Europe Valley and doing all the work I can. <laughs> I'm still where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, coming on to you, Rachit. Rachit, you have a very interesting. Uh, you have an interesting company. You are somewhere uh, in all the conversations that we are currently doing around the gig space. So yeah. now let, let's hear your perspective. Don't limit yourself to your company, your line of work. But in general, what do you think uh, uh, the future of work holds for us in the next sixty seconds? Sure. So firstly, uh, I feel that, uh, you know, the future of work is actually the, the present work and it's no longer a future because we are living that every day, every moment. And uh, I would just like to summarize the, the future of work, what it really holds and what it symbolizes. It's two things, right? It's going to be remote and it's going to be flexible. And when I talk about flexibility, it's going to be flexibility from both sides, from a lot of flexibility from employee side and a lot, lot of flexibility from businesses side, from, from the companies. And uh, you know there has been a major mind, sh mind shift change which, which we are seeing, which is happening. Uh, typically, the word jobs has now been moved to tasks. So companies are are more and more wanting to get work done uh, rather.
rather than you know thinking about employees and fixed cost and everything because we have seen that in the last six months people want to be lean they don't want to be cost heavy centers also from from the employee side uh, what what we are seeing that uh, you know the, the jobs have moved to earning opportunities so people people now are looking for more stable earning opportunities or i would say more regular earning opportunities than a stability of job because we as indians were very you know uh, uptight about that i want a secure job and this thing. and in the last 6 months we have realized that security is a myth there is no secure jobs and everything so how can we build on regular you know flow of income or, or uh, income which is full proof and multiple sources of income i think both those things are, are going to be the future of work from businesses and for employee side cool I mean, that's nice and crisp. Thank you so much. Harsh, over to you. How do you look at the future of work? We talk so much about it. Future of work is a word which is like gig. Everybody likes talking about these two phrases. So, yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Ritu Parnas. So, you know, the world of work actually is uh, undergoing a radical transformation. We've spoken about AI, automation, uh, working, robotics. All this is going to make the shift very significant as it was in time when it was the agriculture, manufacturing and service sectors when there was mechanization. Uh, what's going to happen is while some jobs will be lost, many others will be created. So it's, it's a shifting employment and we're definitely headed towards a new model of working. Now, from my point of view, the underlying principle in, in risk management is to be prepared and be prepared for an event with responses instead of uh, reactions because that's the objective of seizing opportunities because every crisis every risky event every uncertain event comes with an opportunity and i strongly believe that in this post pandemic crisis world we're going to have to work together as a society to ensure a smooth transition towards the future of work by 2002 i was reading an article humans will account for only 60 percent of the total task hours which means that machines share will rise to like 40 percent and then artificial intelligence automation will have expanded beyond the simplistic tasks that they take on today uh, today humans are only involved in administrative communication coordinating managing uh, advising consultancy all these tasks are usually reserved for humans when you fast forward to 2025 or 2030, humans will only be responsible for 45% of the total work hours. So I feel that workers all over the world will need to be prepared for the impact that they'll notice in the fields. And there will be a call for continuous reskilling and upskilling, as there is going to be a new wave of jobs every three years, which we don't even know today. Ritubana, you need to unmute. Sorry. Uh, Venkatesh, I can't see you, uh, but I'm hoping you are there right in the call. Absolutely. Oh, okay, cool. There you are. Thank you so much. So how about, I mean, what what what, what do you see the future to be like? Uh, well, uh, good afternoon to all the participants and the audience. And uh, the panelists have already touched about the future of work and their uh, perspective in terms of how it's going to change. Uh, the way I look into this, I think the way organizations think about employees and the workforce has to change. You know, so I'll give you an example so that everybody can relate. Uh, you know, go back to you know 1990s and 2000s. You buy a cassette. You may like two songs, but you need to pay the cost of all the eight nine songs uh, which are there in a cassette or a CD. So Apple brought in this iTunes ecosystem wherein you pay only what you listen. Similarly, you know, in organizations when they employ current workforce, they expect the person to be in office, you know, in a structured cabin or a workplace for nine hours. You're occupying his time, you're occupying his space, and you're also occupying the mindset in, in terms of the individual has to focus on your specific job role. I think this all will look like a funny thing in the next 10 years to come because individuals would be doing multiple at multiple points in time and with a flexibility. And that's going to be the future of jobs. You know, and it's purely dominated by the economy. You know, so the fear of losing a job uh, you know, will come down. 
and the aspiration to do something what you like will go up you know if you look into any of the analyst reports or any of the researchers uh, you know uh, you, you know in the last couple of months the kind of reports that have come from harvard and other business schools there's a lot of shift that's going to happen and that we we started seeing you know people do the people are productive working from home so that misconception is lost and people are you know getting used to it uh, you are building your own discipline you are bringing in your own style of operation it may take some time but the future jobs will lie about you know why why should an individual work for one organization that that's my question you can work for multiple organizations so you should be paid on the what you bring on to the table rather than number of hours so the metrics in terms of how you measure has to change and that change has to come from all the companies and i think you will see so slowly the fang uh, the facebook apple microsoft and uh, you know the amazons of the world will bring in that initial change wherein you are measured on the skills what you contribute and you are open to do whatever you want and we will pay you for the workload and the metrics uh, that you attain rather than saying that you know you have to be employed with us forever i i think that's more like a shift of the country as we become more flexible especially the gig economy the millennials would love to work for multiple organizations as much as you and maybe they want to moonlight something and they want to start something of their own and i think that flexibility has to be and the first and foremost i believe is that all the hr across the world leading organizations whether it's mncs indian firms or startups should start rethinking their patterns should start rethinking calibration of people you know it i don't think what has led us till now will lead us to the next 10 years organizations will dynamically shift so whatever we are thinking of one individual working toward the company and just attaching himself to one organization uh, will not last forever i don't see in the next 5 years that becomes more relevant you know an individual can be a free answer and at the same time he can you can know, build something of his own maybe he can operate for an infosys at the same time he can also operate for a facebook and building certain workloads you know that flexibility has to be brought in and that that is where the mindset change across organizations more than the economy economy which is developing the hrs and the leaders should think of opening the economy make it making it more flexible modular in approach and the outcomes have to be redefined come to the same by which you use a yardstick by which you used to measure in the last 10 years thank you so much i think uh, the point on flexibility has been uh, shared by multiple panelists already right i think it's given that something which is an ask for the future uh more thing to ask for the future and the point when it is shown about paper use essentially the world is moving to a paper use kind of a mentality the emergence of possibly premium models um uh, uh the fact that you are you have one job and that you you stay in that job for years i think all those concept are of course most likely to get revisited Uh, i think we've drawn upon uh, just to make use of the time i think we've drawn upon a framework through which we will try and approach uh, today's discussion so i think what we will do is uh, just to make it uh, as uh, snappy and engaging for all of us i think uh, i'm going to request each one of you to come in like for example we'll start with how do you think business ecosystems are going to transform into the future and i would request all of you if you could come up with maybe three things essentially which you think will dramatically change or will evolve um into the future it would be great so i think we'll go with the same sequence sanjeeva would you want to come in on this to share with us three things which you think are likely to transform in the business ecosystem of the future yeah so uh, i mean um, uh, I, it, it does appear that you've uh, kind of uh, delivered the point a number of times but i'll, I'll kind of uh, in this thing here see uh, in the business eco front i mean ecosystem one uh, clear thing that we are noticing is uh, is the employer employee uh, relationship shift is what we are actually is the big big trend that we are noticing so employers are happy to look at employees who can work on a contractual basis can look on work on a assignment basis and it is primarily driven by the fact that obviously there has been a revenue downturn their cost optimization has become very critical so how 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 do you how do you kind of build your budgets the usual 2% 3% that we were doing in our annual budgets to beat the inflation will no longer work so a shift 
in this employer employee relationship is one big thing that i look at so which uh, you know to use a use a hackneyed phrase i mean uh, the gig gig uh, employment uh, seems to be one thing that uh, the business ecosystem will need to uh, adapt to the second one is uh, as we move uh, towards more and more adoption of technology so one is the pandemic itself uh, there and the other one is the wave of you know digitization and automation which was already underway in various industries that has got accelerated right so with that comes the new new age skills and the 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 you know uh, uh, ability to adapt to it so that's that's the other big uh, shift that i see and the third one is the mind, i mean the entire mindset you know so it's not only about uh, technology and digitization in a function in, 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 in a business. It's actually the entire ecosystem, which means it's the employees, it's the operations, and it's the consumers. So the entire thing has to work in one digital ecosystem. So those are those three things quickly. I mean, uh, following your instructions, just three things. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> no, it just helps, I think. I think I, I like the yeah. way you put them all together. So we over to you again. There are three things that come to your mind. Yes. So the business ecosystem, rightly mentioned by Rachid, I see this going to be phenomenal shift. Looking at hours and tasks and not number of days present in office. So definitely, business ecosystem would mean that not X number of leaves I'm taking, X number of days I'm present in office. But it will totally shift towards number of hours and number of tasks you are do doing it. And this would be definitely so healthy for organizations as well as employees. I definitely see is it a healthy move. Definitely there will be certain restriction initial time because in terms of second point human capital, this would mean more, uh, more productivity tracking with help of tools, not with help of supervisors. We are used to getting tracked with help of supervisors and our presence are appearing to offices like our day work done types, you know, uh, it, it's been like that. And we have been seeing like I'm present in office. Maybe I'm not present, uh, you know, absently or I'm not putting my hundred percent, but I'm present that's counted it. So even here, tool, pro tool tracking and tool productivity will be a huge uh, uh, I'll, I'll put this in the future of human capital bracket because initially none of the employees or none of the team members going to like this. But this is something over the run, this will something will really, really be so good, uh, even as we, uh, as uh, employees, let's say, or uh, managers, we find our time being saved a lot because we're going to finish our two hour task and two hour task because I'm getting paid for that two hours kind of tracking. And future of regulations and policies, I see companies going to like the fact that somebody's on contract, somebody's taken up dual jobs or dual roles. Let's say I'm a receptionist, I might I'm not utilizing the entire six hours in X company because my workload is only for two hours, but I can go and become a virtual receptionist with another company and I can share my workload. So this is just not the cost implication, but a lot of regulatory or the benefits, employee benefits, which goes, goes in managing uh, uh, this entire organization and team based will also reduce down which will definitely be super super positive in terms of uh, yeah, at least for the employ employees and companies and the organization side and as well as this will be super beneficial for employees because they will be able to uh, get extra income because if i'm able to use my skill sets and deploy to three or four different organizations Yes, here's something. There'll be some organization where you cannot take up similar work. There'll be confidentiality and all of it. But there'll be a lot of work which you can parallelly throw it as a skill. So I see in regulation and policy, it will reduce a lot of employ employers that, and employees will be taking a lot of ownership of insurance, money claims, and all these will be more like a cash benefits going on to employees. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Yudhavi. Um, I think I'll come to Rachit. Rachit, on business ecosystems, if you could talk about three things, and we will cover all the rest in the second and the future rounds. Sure, sure, sure. So um, I think the business ecosystem is going to be driven probably uh, by three main factors. First is going to be lean scalability, right? Scalability is in the minds of everybody, and businesses want to be lean when they scale up. 
and uh, you know uh, uh, again coming to, to my point that they want to pay for what is being delivered to them so so anything extra will will be out of the pocket uh, out of the out of the box so so lean scalability is one thing uh, second more important factor which we'll see in the business ecosystem is the tracking of work how the work is being tracked uh, throughout right how we are tracking work how how is how uh, making sure that it's meeting our targets and remote tracking of work how seamlessly is being done because now people won't be sitting in front of you. They are probably working remotely and probably working remote hours as well. So, how, and probably the workforce from 10 people has gone to 100 people because now I'm paying on, on deliverable basis. So, how am I automating all the work and making sure it's being done? Third and more importantly, it's going to be a lot more process driven. Because if you're talking about future of work, if you're talking about remote work, it has to be a process driven, driven by, uh, you know, hard code technology, which is basically uh, aiding as a, a you know, uniform or, or something which is bringing all the remote workforces at the same level. Because now I'm not having a physical interaction with a lot of people. So I think these three things, uh, you know, lean scalability, tracking mechanisms and process driven, I think that is going to be the number one, the top three things uh, in terms of business ecosystems. Thanks. Great. Uh, Harsh, I'm going to make use of the fact that you come from the risk background and hence, can you respond to this point about the future of business ecosystem from the perspective of risk that organization needs to bear in mind? Sure. You know, Ritu, unfortunately, risk always looks negative. I mean, people always see risk as a very negative term. We don't have to be prepared for uncertain events because Uncertain events by its nature always cause some impact on organizations. And traditionally, business ecosystems used to risk only from a finance or insurance point of view. But crisis after crisis, whether it's the 2008 financial crisis and even the recent pandemic, has reinforced that there needs to be an enterprise risk management process, a very strong, robust enterprise risk management process, which really helps organizations identifying, assessing, and mitigating the risks across the business ecosystem. We're talking about stakeholder management, looking at potential black swan events, preparing for business continuity, procurement risk, supply chain risk, uh, managing a cyber attack, managing people, mental health issues. And every crisis actually reminds organizations that you need to integrate risk management into the culture that will help you in risk-based decision-making. This is my first feedback. The second thing is what's going to happen is we're going to see new CXO roles that will gain prominence. For example, the role of chief risk officer is now becoming very important. Uh, chief compliance officer, chief ethics officer. Someone was telling me chief health officer is becoming the new norm. Chief negotiation officer. So all these new CXO roles will gain a lot more importance as organizations uh, truly explore new ways of working. And the third thing is in terms of creating business models that can adapt to any patients will have to visit them to make sure that the balance sheets and the cost structures are more resilient and come up with revenue share structures or uh, you know structures which will really not be a burden on the cost even reshaping the business portfolio having a diversified product line will will create greater value and ensure there's no single product risk and even hiring people like some of the panelists said that on contractual arrangements, why can't we look at skill-based hiring? So my, from my point of view, these are some of the strategies on risk management and how organizations are in, in enterprise risk management. Thank you. Thank you so much. Venkatesh, can I bring you in here about how are you looking at uh, the future of business ecosystems? And, and, and um, I mean, given that your role with NSDC is such, you, you're spending a lot of time on the digital side. How are you looking at business ecosystems, or what are you planning for? No, I, I think one of the things I, I come from an, in a corporate experience. It was a year at NSDC. I worked prior to that as a country director with uh, Deloitte, and before that, heading the Microsoft Innovation Center for more than uh, ten years now in that ecosystem. So, you know, the way I look into it is the, the future of work is from a business perspective. I would say it, it should be more collaborative. Uh, people can't grow in silos. Organizations can't grow in silos. They're interoperable and they should be more collaborative. Uh, if I look at my perspective of what we are doing from a context of NSDC, what you touched upon, uh, one of the things I'm looking into is bringing in partnerships from various set of organizations. Uh, together, for example, we run the scaling ecosystem and the charter for India. 
So we have uh, uh, almost every district of India has Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Kendras, which are called PMKKs, the Centers of Excellence for Skilling. And with the kind of a reach and outreach, what we have, we require many technology interventions, many, con many content providers, technology platforms, LMSs, counseling, certifications, assessment organizations. We need to bring many of them together. So in that process, in the last one year, uh, we added a lot of momentum. I've, I'm happy to share between COVID, uh, that means around roughly, roughly around 25th or 24th of March when India went to lockdown for now, we brought in close to 12 interesting partnerships. And those partnerships are with a very highly scalable, sustainable, and impactful one. For example, we partnered with Microsoft and Satya has announced the global skilling opportunity of, you know, uh, and rolling out an opportunity to skill close to 25 million people across the world where Microsoft is committed. You know, India was the first India was the first country, and NSDC was the first organization uh, at a global level to partner with them within a week's time of their announcement. And we partnered uh, with them to skill roughly a lakh people in India on digital skilling, wherein we are providing them interventions on digital skilling, access to various Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, which are no more a skills by choice because everybody uses them actively in the blue collar workforce across 37 sector skill councils which we manage we have seen huge uh, you know aspiration among them to learn digital skills and similarly we work with britannia during the lockdown phase in empowering women entrepreneurs and uh, you know encouraging them to come out with startup ideas because britannia has a wide reach and uh, you know i think government organizations should work together in providing that kind of a scale in preparing the workforce for the new uh, era uh, similarly, we brought a LinkedIn partnership last week in terms of LinkedIn launching something called LinkedIn Coaches and uh, LinkedIn Learning, which is a new aspect of LinkedIn. For example, every individual across organizations who wish to contribute in coaching people can sign up as a philanthropic activity uh, and under the LinkedIn Coaches, you know, they can contribute certain hours. So NSDC partnered with them to bring in a lot of these LinkedIn Coaches to impact the larger trainer training skilling Killing ecosystem across India, you know. So this is these are some of the partnerships. We've seen that support in IBM. Uh, we also seen a lot of uh, usage of English uh, related app across our skill ecosystem because a lot of our talent uh, we have seen in even the blue collar workforce, people with access to spoken English who can understand English are paid better wages. So we tied up with close to six, seven different English skills and skill centric apps in offering them uh, free lucky. Because the challenge I see in the COVID times is that a lot of people have gone back to their villages. Uh, migrant labor has gone back. So it, it, it could be a certain problem in getting jobs to everyone. The other way, the dimension I see is nano entrepreneurship. You know, how can people start something of their own with 15 to 20,000 rupees? So for that, we partnered yes. with Airtel. Let's say Airtel payment is now planning to penetrate into deeper, uh, you know, into the rural places because they see the markets uh, opening up there. So we partnered with them in providing uh, financial inclusion centric courses for them to make those people enable them and also make them non entrepreneurs in terms of they working at agents in the last mile transactions. We are talking to very interesting firms like Finopitech, we are talking to a lot of microfinance organizations to see how people can be involved in the rural places so that we help them with the opportunity to be not just finding a job, but being, uh, you know, using their skills and being a non entrepreneur so that, you know, they can create a value and they can grow in that particular ecosystem. And, uh, you know, similarly, I would say uh, different partnerships at different levels we are exploring, right from startups. We brought in uh, an upgrad to an artist to, you know, some of the interesting startups with, with which we brought in solutions to make people go online. All our physical classrooms have close to lockdown scenarios. So we use a lot of interesting startups to create online platforms so that people can continue learning. And similarly, you know, a partnership with Geo we are now exploring in terms of making a data accessible to every rural village, every training center within the NSDC ecosystem. I think different partners have to come in, whether they are technology providers, they are technology enablers, or they are content providers, or even you know, new age assessments and organizations which can make things much more faster uh, from an Learn, learning standpoint, upskilling and reskilling standpoint. So this is this is how we typically look at NSDC. I believe co collaborating and bringing all the synergies together from various organizations, from startups to micro SMEs to SMEs to 
large enterprises, that's where the future lies. Because one kind of a solution doesn't fit in India. You know, we need diverse. Uh, we have a diverse ecosystem in a larger country of 1.3 billion population. So you know, everybody has to play a role in driving this change. Thank you. Um, I think I've, I've, in this particular segment, we picked up a lot of points. I think we've been picking up the points on, on the, uh, uh, there, there will be an emerging need for flexibility, there will be remote work, um, there would be change in organization structures, uh, there will be more collaborative organization structures which are largely to emerge. Uh, the risk elements that did not exist earlier are going to become, will, will, uh, get magnified in the future environment. Uh, the workplace scenarios are changing. Uh, amidst all of this, uh, how do we foresee the future of human capital will be the next segment. Uh, and hence, I would want to uh, request our uh, panelists to kind of again spend the next 60 seconds telling us uh, uh, in, again, the tools of three uh, about what are the what are the three things that distinctly stand out are likely to happen, uh, and if anybody's wanting to hop on to the uh, to the to the employment or the livelihood market, if I may say so, should bear in mind, or any future employer should bear in mind. So your thoughts. I'll start with you, Sanjeeva. Yeah, Ritu. Thanks. Uh, see, uh, see, from the employment or the human capital uh, point of view, as we said, one big change <coughs> that we are seeing is very clearly uh, the adoption of technology and hence the need to be skilled and, you know, uh, if it requires reskilling, then we need to have that reskilling. Or if it requires an upskilling. Now, for instance, let's take a uh, take the uh, you know a job of a banker. So, if you ask him about seven years or eight years back, that do you know what is cyber security? Do you uh, look at UI? Do you look at UX? Do you look at VPN? He would say, no, I'm happy with the cash flows. But now, I mean, the he has to be very much aware about what is cyber security. So, so even the role is, is changing. Now, you take it the other extreme, a lab technician, for example, right? So earlier he was happy filling test tubes, putting it in the laboratory, gets the test puts it in an envelope and sends it across. But what does he have to do now? He has to use a spectrometer, maybe he has to use a sensors and he has to do it. So, I mean, uh, a, a huge shift, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, the, the the skill sets of the human capital. So that's one 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 big change I'm, I'm seeing. The second one is, as I mentioned, I would like to elaborate a little bit on the uh, the social aspect, the, the, the social aspect which uh, we uh, probably gets understated in, in in this you know all talk about technology so you you are creating a workforce where i mean it, the 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 white collar uh, is is probably part of them are working from home there are people working in the you know a shop floor or the workshops or on or if it is a sales team working on the on, on the ground so how do you manage this hybrid model in terms of you know the expectations on two sides of the employees i mean uh, uh, one group uh, tends to be probably left behind how do you culturally fit uh, the other team? I mean, how, how do you manage this whole whole change? It's easier said than, said than done that, okay, you will work from home and you will come here. But then uh, if I'm not there at home, my boss is sitting out there, I have this perpetual feeling that, oh, I'm not the probably the part of the A team. So, I mean, it may not come out so strongly, but it's repeatedly happening. So how do you manage this cultural, cultural thing? Thirdly, you see, uh, from a purely, I'm saying from a from a from a CEO point of view, I need to onboard employees and young people uh, continuously. So in the earlier good old days, I had uh, you know trusted employees. I get new employees. I tell them, okay, this is he's your mentor. He'll guide you through the whole thing. Learn the processes. Pick it up. Two weeks after this, we are going to meet up. I'll I'll uh, have have a chat with you, and then we are on. That's the way we would move around. Now, how do you do that? You can get the onboarding, recruitment, etc., everything online. But how, how do you get that young person integrated into the in, in, into the office? How who is there to take care of him? How 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 do you how do you manage that part? I mean, that is something which probably we will we'll need to uh, you know dwell on and figure, figure out. I mean, I think uh, needs a lot of discussion on this. Sure. Um, I think because of paucity of time, I think we will try and make it as quick. And maybe I would get a little selective and ask. Um, a few of you to comment on the remaining points. So, Surabhi, I do want to hear from your side on what you think should be, uh, what are the things that from a human capital perspective you see is going to be an emerging trend? 
Sure, at the point in my answer, we'll also answer two of the questions put on chat by audience. First thing is that for human capital, all the skills and the core skills remain same, but every single human capital in uh, every single individual will have to add these skills post COVID. That is self management because they're not people like Sanjeeva said, who mentor and do it. Self management and project management tools you need to learn. If you don't know, please go ahead, learn how to manage project management tools and self management and reporting over reporting and over communicating to your managers is very important so these are additional skills apart from whatever people have been doing stays but over communication that is reporting management project management is additional and and my uh, take uh, on human capital and especially for people above 40 plus years and that's also a question there what they have missed the bus onto the actual skills i'll say go catch another bus you cannot now say that i have missed IT bus find out another bus learn yourself teach yourself it skills get it otherwise you are obsolete we especially know about demographic dividend of india we especially know about millennials you know who are coming with tech powers and are willing to work in the uh, are willing to get break you know they're willing to work in one tenth of the cost you are paying so if you want to catch up with them know that you are standing back again as a college girls and start relearning all the technology with the same enthusiasm yes Ritu sure. um I've, again uh, i'm gonna come to you um harsh why don't you tell us about three things that you'll see you you anticipate will change change in the legal and regulatory environment so i think uh, you know if you see the global risk report by the world economic forum there are certain trends that are shaping the future uh, aging population, rising participation from women in the workforce, increasing uncertainties like diseases, dependency on technology, wealth disparity, uh, rising middle class population. Now, to tackle all these global trends and be prepared from a legal and policy standpoint, you have to ensure that you have the following policies. One is a workplace health and safety policy will need a lot of focus and emphasis now. There will also have to be an equal opportunity policy with women in the workforce playing a significant role. Employee code of conduct will become more important, especially after remote working. There is a huge conversation around empathy and emotional quotient and managers treating their subordinates in the right way. Risk management and business security, I've already emphasized on that. A robust cyber security and technology policy. I think it's shocking to say 90 in companies faced a cyber attack in the last six months. This is a survey. So we are not really prepared for a digital economy. And hence, data privacy will become very important. You're going to have workers who are working at home, whether they put a pen drive, steal the data, run away. How do you manage these kind of issues? And the last one is the reputation policy. Organizations are more worried than ever about reputation. How is the entire governance culture? So I think these are the few points. I don't want to uh, spend more time on repeating anything. So I think uh, for both Rachit and Venkat, the last question would be that, again, three things that you would quickly want to call out on technology and innovation, which is likely to happen. I know it's a very often talked about subject, but Quickly, three things if each one of you could share, and then we can move on to the questions. Rachid, you want to go first? Sure. So I think uh, what we are seeing in terms of technology is, uh, you know, a lot of inclusion of, of masses. How can technology actually be an enabler of including a lot of people who actually, uh, you know, as Surbhi had put, take another bus, who kind of missed out the bus? Or I think you went on mute, Rachid. Um, so I'm saying uh, that uh, firstly, the technology, what we'll see is a lot is going to be an enabler uh, of how people can get into the work ecosystem, how we can consolidate a lot of people probably who miss the bus or who are, who are not a part of the regular working force. How can they become a part of regular working force? Uh, secondly, you know, I feel that there is going to be a, a great mix of skills, experience and passion. So till now, you know, people were basically working what their skills and experience have been. And now we are seeing that a lot of people have a lot of passion about some things and how technology can help them learn those skills and learn those passions and, and find adequate working opportunities on them. 
And thirdly, I think, uh, as Subhi has also pointed out, uh, self-governance is going to be a big, big factor. So how can technology, uh, you know, be a thing which is governing my work or you know, regulating my work on, on a daily basis and correcting if I'm doing something wrong? So all, all the big jargon, AI, ML, everything is going to be a part of the regular work system, which is going to be seen now. Sure. Thanks so much. Apologies. Venkatesh, um, you have to wrap up very quickly, but please help me with three things that you think you should be look at, watching out for. From an innovation. Think, uh, yeah, from an, uh, please, three things to quickly pick. One, I would say uh, I would bet on collaborative platforms, uh, the requirement to build technology based collaborative platforms to drive or empower gig economy uh, that will be on a rise second is uh, the increased uh, use of ai uh, ai will become more uh, usable scenario in various uh, uh, patterns right from a conversational ai to ai to help productivity ai to fix a lot of things uh, as sundar pichai keeps always saying that AI becomes as necessary as your water and electricity in the coming time we can see that trend happening very fast and the third thing is on RPA, uh, automation and RPA, because a lot of job roles and a lot of things can be done in an automated manner. So, you know, these are the three things I would say uh, majorly picking up that can change the ecosystem. Sure. I think I'll pick up a few questions which I thought were quite interesting. Um, um, anybody can respond to that, any one of you. I think what are the um, I mean, post problems, what could be the skill requirements? Maybe one or two skills that you think will become something stand out uh, from your perspective. That's one of the questions. So I think coding, coding, technology, uh, risk management, these are the three outstanding skills which as an institution. Uh, because even if you see some of the upcoming jobs, wherever there are posting of jobs, right? These are some of the critical aspects which stand out. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of schools implementing the design thinking, coding as a critical element, which says that you all are ready to prepare the future leaders with these kind of skills. I would say coding, risk management, and uh, something on the lines of uh, digital marketing, digital tools, digital technology. Sure. One question, and I think Venkatesh, maybe you are the right person to take it up, that there's a lot of skilling that's going on. and skilling programs which are running. So what percentage of the people are able to get into jobs after gaining these skills? Is there any data point that's available? So, you know, uh, all the program-based skilling which we do through the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal program and the other skilling centers, we would say, are, are aimed at uh, providing the employability to the last mile in terms of people who are enrolling into it. So we see roughly around 60 to 65 percent of the people coming out of these either getting better jobs if they're already in the jobs or getting an opportunity to be part of an organized, uh, you know, the skill force of the blue collar workforce. So most of our programs, what we done in our centers, uh, the outcome is a job. You know, that's how we typically operate. And we are seeing the pickup being happening. And but it, of course, the percentage doesn't remain the same across all sectors. It varies from construction to retail to electrical, plumbing and different, different different areas of job but roughly most of us of them have a percentage uh, around 60 to 65 percent of them getting placed uh, in these job roles perfect i think we pretty much responded to most of the questions we've touched upon all the points we i think optimally utilize our time this is a conversation which is supposed to be present continuous and we we probably for the for the time being taking a pause Thank you so much, Surabhi, Hai, Sanjeeva, Venkatesh, Rachif, for your time. It was really thank nice you. and crisp and, and, and really a uh, learning experience. So thank you so much. Hope all of you also enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the team panel and Dedicates for being here with us today. Special thanks to our sponsors. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.